Hi, I'm Carolyn Gage, and this is my PowerPoint, Interrupting Racism, a Technique for Social Cowards. And uh, I put this together because I am a social coward. I care about social justice issues, and I work very hard to be an ally. And I am deeply conflict averse and very reluctant to confront people. Um, it doesn't help that I'm autistic, but autistic or not, I think there's a lot of people that feel this way. Um, people can be very politically aware and conscious about diversity issues and still get caught off guard when they're at a party or hanging out with friends or at a family gathering or in a classroom or a lecture. And suddenly, out of the blue, somebody says something that is just unbelievably, jaw-droppingly offensive, insensitive, ignorant, or all of the above. And often it is the last person you expected to do that. So this is what happens to me. First, I'm like, oh my God, did I even hear that right? Did they really say that? Then I look around. Am I the only person who's having a problem with this? Uh, or sometimes I just look at the floor because I'm embarrassed for the other person. Why am I being embarrassed when they're the one who did it? One of life's little mysteries. Or I get really angry and then I guess I hope they read my mind. Or I just start emanating death rays uh, from my thermonuclear silence and I expect that that will stop them dead in their tracks. I'm also likely to be sitting there thinking, somebody else is going to confront this. Somebody who knows the speaker better than I do or somebody who is more political than me or somebody who's a person of color, or somebody who isn't, or somebody who isn't as shy as me, or somebody who's a better speaker, or somebody who organized this event. But guess what? That somebody else I'm waiting for usually doesn't speak up. Nobody does anything. So then I go home and I stay awake at night thinking about all the clever things I could have said, but I didn't. And of course, none of this makes me feel very good about myself. And it certainly doesn't lend itself to social justice it actually enables social injustice. And I think I'm not the only person who's been there. And even people who teach this stuff professionally, it is hard to speak up and it's especially hard in a social environment. So after a lot of trial and error and reading a lot of different sources, I put together a five point technique that enables me to get in there quickly before I have time to talk myself out of it, say what I need to say and get out without losing my focus, losing my temper, or ending up arguing about something that isn't even my point that I don't care about and that I can't prove anyway. It's also something I can memorize and rehearse and I do love that. Why? Because what a person rehearses will become a reflex. Left to my own devices, I have cowardly, conflict avoidant reflexes. But this technique helps me develop healthy speaking up reflexes. So let's get started. Interrupting racism a technique for social cowards. So I'm going to be teaching a technique that has five steps. And if you take the first letter of each step, the acronym spells Honda, H-O-N-D-A, like the car. That's why it's easy to remember. And there's a hyphen after the D and we'll talk about that. But for right now, just think Honda. So there's the acronym, and um, that's a 1977 Honda. That says something about how old I am. Well, one of the things that I really like about this is that the first three steps don't take a whole lot of thinking. You can be more than halfway through the confrontation before you really have to start using up any mental bandwidth. What I mean is this is a technique that will get you in there and get you off to a running start. And that's a really good thing when you're caught off guard by an offensive or insensitive remark in a social situation, because that situation is going to have a certain amount of momentum. So for the person confronting to have a running start, that's really helpful. So the acronym H-O-N-D hyphen A, like the car, and I'm going to go through those right now. Step one, H, that stands for halt, as in halt whatever's going on, like when you step out on the street and you wave your arms around. 
This is a really easy step. You just say, wait, yo, hold up, stop, hang on. Personally, I like wait, wait, wait. I'm not fond of excuse me because that's actually an apology and you're not apologizing. So that's it, step one. And what does it do? It stops the momentum of the social interaction and it gives you the floor. Everybody shuts up and they look at you. All right, let's go to step two. The second step is O. That stands for own the problem. Now this is really important. It also seems counterintuitive. Someone has said or done something offensive or insensitive. Clearly they have the problem. But do they? People say and do all kinds of offensive and insensitive things for all kinds of reasons. They can do it to assert or display power, to provoke or bait someone, to recruit allies, to intimidate, to create bonding with others who share their views, to make themselves feel better. In terms of their objectives, their comment or their action can actually be working very well for them. I am speaking up because what they did is not working for me. And therefore, I am having the problem. So, not my problem. Yes, actually it is and actually owning the problem is going to be your superpower how is it a superpower because if you say something like dude that's racist they're going to challenge your authority if it's a racist joke, they might come back with, yeah, well, my brother-in-law who's black told it to me. And you know what? Maybe they don't even have a brother-in-law, but you're not going to know that. So now you have to explain why this brother-in-law, who you don't even know and who may not exist, is wrong about a race issue or else prove why you're the universal expert on what is and what is not racist. Do you have a degree in African-American studies? Do you need to name all the books you've read or the anti-racism workshops you've taken? This challenge to your authority is going to take you very far away from the point you want to make, and it's going to send the whole conversation in a direction that is not going to be productive for you, but it's going to be very helpful for the person you're confronting because it puts you on the defensive and diverts attention from what they did. How can you avoid that? By owning the problem, as crazy as that sounds. How do you own the problem? You say one of these statements, and either one will work. You memorize them. Just one sentence. I'm uncomfortable with what you just said. Or, I'm uncomfortable with what just happened. That's it. That's step two. How on earth can that be a superpower? Because you may not be able to prove that you're an expert on what is and what is not racist. But there is one subject on which you are a recognized total authority, and not just nationally, and not just internationally, but intergalactically. So what is that subject? You are the authority on what makes you comfortable and uncomfortable. There's nobody else in the world who can make that call. You are it, the final authority. Other people can try to guess, but you have the last word on what makes you uncomfortable. I mean, think about it. If you say, I'm uncomfortable, and someone in the room shouts, no, you're not, who's going to be the one who looks foolish? And here's the thing. When people are uncomfortable, it's pretty universally acknowledged they have a right to try and fix it for themselves. If you're freezing, it's pretty much acceptable to speak up and see if you can close a window or turn up the heat or go get a sweater. When you say, <clears throat> I'm uncomfortable with what you just said. You are stating the basis for your authority in interrupting. <clears throat> you are uncomfortable, and now you're going to do something that might help you feel more comfortable. That little sense, sentence is very powerful. It's well worth memorizing and using for any kind of confrontation. Okay, so you have halted what is going on. That was step one. Yo. 
you have owned the problem. I'm uncomfortable with what's going on. And that explains your reason for interrupting. And what do you do now? Step three, N, name what they did. My example here is that someone just said Columbus discovered America. So you name what they did. You just said Columbus discovered America. That's it. Stop right there. That is step three, just the facts. Don't add, and that's totally inaccurate. Don't add your opinion or your reaction. Hang in with me. There will, you'll be able to do that later, but not now. In step three, name as factually as you can exactly what just happened. Why? Well, I'll tell you. You may have heard it wrong. Maybe you showed up late and they were saying, well, my grandmother still insists Columbus discovered America. You don't need to confront that. The speaker doesn't agree with their grandmother. You missed the first part of the sentence. Okay, maybe you didn't hear it wrong or misinterpret it. Step three is still important and I will tell you why. It's like when people are in a drum circle. The first thing you do is you get everybody on the downbeat. So the leader hits the drum and everybody in the circle tries to hit the drum at the same time. Everybody's gonna have their own pattern, their own rhythm, their own musical personality or opinion, and it's gonna get pretty wild in the drum circle. But they start off on the downbeat. They start off together, and that keeps things from getting too crazy. You want everybody to be crystal clear about what had just happened, whether or not they think there's anything racist about it or not. Maybe they weren't even paying attention. They didn't hear the Columbus remark. They're upset because something disruptive is happening. They're confused. They're struggling to form an opinion with inadequate information. So this step gives everyone a chance to catch up, to get in sync on the downbeat. What is it you're so upset about? before all the different perspectives and opinions start to break out. This is a breather. You stopped what was going on. You got the floor. You explained why you have a right to be stopping it. And now you're naming factually exactly what just happened in words that everybody in the room can agree with, whether or not they perceived it as offensive. Just the facts, and you should be able to get consensus. All right, so let's review H-O-N. Halt, own the problem, and name what happened. So now you have done three of the five steps. You're three-fifths of the way through. That wasn't too hard, was it? Yeah, congratulations. And you've made a huge impact already, and you haven't even had to break a mental or an emotional sweat. But now we come to step four. Yeah, step four. The going is going to get tough here. Step four, you're going to describe how you feel and why. And I like this little poster, speak your truth even if your voice shakes, good advice. So now is the time for saying Columbus didn't discover anything. Thousands of native nations were already here. Now is also the time to say Columbus didn't discover America, he invaded it. Now is also the time when you could say, when you said Columbus discovered America, I felt angry about all the history and all the native rights that are being erased. I feel angry about all the ways that Native Americans still are not treated fairly. Or, Columbus and his men enslaved and abducted and murdered many native people. It's important to me to tell the truth about that and speak up about the lies. Yeah. Step four is hard. So, here are some handy tips for step four. Stay on your side of the street. You, your feelings, your analysis. Use I statements not you. Do not speak for anyone except yourself, and that is true even if you are a member of the demographic that's being insulted. If you are Native American and you say Native Americans are sick and tired of having our history appropriated, consider there may be someone in the room who's also Native American and who has been raised with different views who might stand up and contradict you. 
Now you're going to find yourself in a very uncomfortable position of having an argument with a member of your community where you are needing to prove that they are wrong. And wouldn't the person you are confronting love that distraction? This is not what you're here to do. Speak for yourself. Now you can say, it's been my experience that Native Americans are sick and tired of, etc. Then, if you're challenged by a member of your community who thinks the Columbus thing is harmless, you can just respectfully say, well, that has not been my experience, and let it go. Stick with the I statements, which is how you keep the confrontation on track. And finally, don't lecture. Yes, of course, volumes can be said about Columbus, but lecturing people is often not productive. Why? Well, I'll tell you. Here's the secret to step four, which is describing how you feel. You are confronting because you need to hear yourself speak up. You're doing this for yourself. You're not trying to change the other person. That may or may not happen. You have no control over that. You do have control over how you represent yourself. Put your attention there. Think about it. How do you like it when other people try to change you? How do you react when other people try to change you? So here's the thing. It's like the difference between a roommate who puts a poster up in their own bedroom and the roommate who puts it up in a common space like the kitchen. It's none of your business what people hang on the walls of their own brain. But the second they put it out in public space where people have to listen to what's in their brain, then you have a right to let them know you're uncomfortable. When you're trying to change a person, it's like you barge into their bedroom and you're trying to get them to take down a poster over the bed. You are in their business. But if that poster is something they hung in the kitchen, you are not trying to change their taste in posters. You're saying, look, this is my space too, and I'm uncomfortable with that poster, and here's why. It is really important in step four that you stay in your lane. Why? It's about respect. If you address someone with disrespect in order to get them to treat you with respect, it's just not going to work. It may not work if you address them with respect, but I guarantee it won't work if your language and your actions are disrespectful. And disrespectful behavior includes the obvious, you know, insulting, but trying to change them, trying to shame them, using disrespectful language, telling them about themselves, which includes analyzing their behavior. The reason you say this is, or the reason you believe, you know, whatever, getting in their business, threatening them, mocking them. And I am talking a whole lot about step four because it's not an easy step, but it's really important. So here's another tip. If you get upset and emotional explaining why you're uncomfortable, that is totally natural. If your voice is shaking or your face is red, if you have tears coming out of your eyes, that's natural. You're the one who's uncomfortable. You own that. You are the one feeling the pain. And maybe it is personal. Maybe it's deeply embedded in your ancestry, as with Native Americans and colonial narratives like that Columbus thing. Maybe you're thinking of people you know who've taken their lives because of a lifetime of hearing racist jokes or slurs or misappropriations of their history. Of course you're going to be emotional. And the person you're confronting may not be having any emotions at all, except they're annoyed that, you, that you're calling them out. And that can be frustrating or infuriating that they're so cool. And both very strong emotions and both very natural in a confrontation. So if your voice is shaky, if you're tearing up, if you're crying, these are not signs of weakness. They're signs of authenticity. You are being real. Good for you. There's power in that. You get to be messy. All right, so it's okay to mess up in step four because people who make racist comments probably have a lot more practice than people who are trying to confront them. Very few of us do our best thinking on our feet. And your step four, where you describe how you feel, can be messy, not on point, emotional, and maybe only makes sense to you, or maybe it doesn't even make sense to you. That's okay. You probably already made your biggest impact with the first three steps anyway. 
So before we move to the final step, it's time for the seven inning stretch, the mysterious hyphen between the D and the A. What is that? It is the pause. And this is the part where you listen, where you observe. What is the other person going to do? They might apologize. They might get defensive. They might be confused. They might tell you they need time to think about it. Be aware it's most likely they're going to be defensive, honestly. Brace for that. And listen respectfully, even if they're not being respectful. And then you're going to bring it all home with step five. Honda. Step five, A. A is for accountability. What is it you need to ask them to do? I need to ask you not to say that Columbus discovered America because it's not true and it's harmful. You can also say things like, I need to ask you to stop telling that joke. I need you to stop using that word or that expression. Notice the phrase, I need to ask you. That's important because it means you're still on your side of the street. You're staying in your lane. You do need to ask. You're confronting. It's part of a confrontation. It looks like a small thing. I need to ask you not to say that again as opposed to don't say that again. But that phrase, again, gives you the basis for your authority. I need to ask. You're doing it to complete the process of hearing yourself speak up. Stay in your lane. And believe it or not, step five, asking for what you need, can be a huge relief to the person you're confronting. Let's go back to the example of your roommate's poster that they put up in the kitchen. You're not telling them they're an awful person. You're not saying you can't live with them. You're not asking them to change their taste in art or switch political parties. You're saying you don't want to eat breakfast every morning looking at that poster. You're not trying to cancel them or saying they deserve to be canceled. You're just asking them to take the poster down. Problem solved. You are confronting a behavior. You're not confronting their values, their personality, their worthiness to live on the same planet as you. And just like I said with the hyphen thing, it is very unlikely they'll do what you're asking. They might, but do not count on it. Remember, your goal is to hear yourself speak up. You need to ask for something, and you let them know you need to ask and then you tell them what you're asking for. And since you can pretty much count on them not agreeing with you, I recommend you make friends with a technique called the broken record. And some of you don't even know what a record is, right? So a broken record is one where the needle skips. And some of you might not know what that is either. But the point is that the record keeps repeating itself over and over. Does that make you sound stupid? No, it makes you sound assertive makes them look stupid. You're not letting your point get lost. You're focused. Perhaps they're the one looking a little obtuse because you need to repeat yourself. If you have a good point you feel clear about, don't worry about how many times you repeat it. Also, you do not have to engage with them. You're confronting to hear yourself speak up. If they insult you, you can affirm that you are hearing them. I understand that you think that joke is funny. I don't. I'm still uncomfortable. I understand none of your other friends see anything wrong with that word, and I'm still uncomfortable. I understand that you think I am too sensitive. I don't think that I am, and I'm still uncomfortable. You can say, I understand you think I'm taking this the wrong way. I don't believe that I did, and I'm still uncomfortable with your use of that word. The main thing is this. Don't take the bait. Now, are there consequences? If there are, you can say so. But here's the thing with a consequence. You need to be prepared to carry them out. If you said you're going to hang up, hang up. If you said you'd leave the table, leave the table. And maybe you know there will be some consequences and you choose not to share them at this time. Sometimes I know a person's actions um, are going to affect my relationship to them. I don't have to tell them that. Sometimes I know I'm going to report them to somebody. I don't have to tell them that. Okay, so what about the enablers? 
Okay, here's a picture of a food fight situation, but it looks to me, if we're just guessing here, that the guy with his hand in the gravy bowl is the instigator, the woman laughing at the head of the table is an enabler, and maybe the guy drinking a toast is also an enabler. The guy sitting down left, who might be Ted Danson, I don't know, he's thinking, I'm uncomfortable with what's happening and maybe I should confront it. But let's say this is Thanksgiving. Um, let's say Uncle Frank drinks too much at gatherings like this and then he loves to get your goat by making racist or sexist or homophobic comments. So you confront him. Aunt Betty leans over, begging you to let it go. She says, oh, honey, uh, you know how your uncle is. He doesn't mean any harm. She is begging you. You can see it in her eyes. She's enabling his bad behavior, and she is needing for you to enable it too. She's probably afraid. She's also probably embarrassed. No doubt she has a long and painful history that you only know a small part of. Do you let it go because she's asked you to? Maybe, but you have choices. You can say this. Aunt Betty, I understand that you feel Uncle Frank doesn't mean what he says, and I'm still uncomfortable hearing that word used. I will need to leave if I hear it again. I'm sorry this is upsetting to you. Hearing that word is deeply upsetting to me. Yeah, you can do that. Yes, you can. And then, of course, if he says that word again, and he probably will, you will have to leave because you have given a consequence and you will need to carry it out. And you have my permission to take your casserole with you when you go. And everyone at the table may think you did something awful and rude and antisocial. But when Uncle Frank is in the hospital dying of cirrhosis or Aunt Betty's in the hospital with broken ribs, those family members might find themselves thinking back on that Thanksgiving and they might see your actions in a different light. And this brings us to a critical piece of the confrontation. The backlash. Everybody who confronts feels a backlash. It might come from other people like Aunt Betty, but it might also come from a voice in your own head. And it can sound like this. I did it wrong. I sounded like an idiot. I made a mess. People think I'm a prude, a jerk, a little snowflake, some kind of thought police. I ruined the party, the dinner, the date. I embarrassed my friend, my partner, my date, myself. I insulted the host. I made an enemy out of my teacher or my boss. I made a mountain out of a molehill. Nobody likes me. What is wrong with me anyway? And oh my God, never again. So when the voice in your head gets going, I want you to remember this. This is what they don't tell you. The backlash for an action is directly proportional to the effectiveness of that action. In other words, the more you trash talk yourself, the more you nailed it. Yeah. Also, keep in mind, you cannot judge the impact of your action by people's immediate reactions. You have no idea what they may be thinking anyway. They may be wearing a mask to hide their feelings. Also, change takes time to process. How they feel about what you did today may change tomorrow, next week, next year. It's like I said, they might remember Thanksgiving differently. And finally, you did it for you. It's not about them. Remember, the whole point was for you to become someone who speaks up. That was the goal, and you did. You did it on step one when you said stop. You are being somebody who speaks up now. So, on behalf of the planet, thank you. And let me know how it goes.